family, I'm excited because today we are continuing the brand new sermon series, the last sermon series of the 2023 calendar year entitled Timing. Somebody say Timing. The reason I believe the Holy Spirit has us going this route with this particular series is because God wants us to know, listen, I need my people to be aware of the role that they play with colliding with their appointed time. There's so much teaching about the timing of God, and so we just think it's going to happen just because God is going to allow it to happen. God's like, okay, hold up. Your decisions and obedience matter too. If they didn't, the text wouldn't tell us in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 17, don't be over wicked, don't be a fool. Why must you die before your time? If it was not possible for you to live a life of rebellion and disobedience and miss your appointed time. And as I was reading this particular article a few weeks ago, it contained a very powerful quote by Henry Harvey McKay, he's an amazing author, Harvey McKay, he said this, time, it's free, but yet it's priceless. Time, you can't own it, own it, but you can use it. Time, you can't keep it, but you can spend it. Time, time, the gift of time and discipline with time management is the highest form of stewardship said one more time the gift of time because time is a gift I want us to start viewing your time like your life because time is life when you have no longer life this means you're no longer in time so when you waste your time you will end up wasting your life and I've arrived to this place in my life personally wasting my time is a form of disrespect Anybody? You come and play with my emotions, that's a form of disrespect. You have no intentions of, of actually sowing into my life, me sowing into you, to where our relationship is me helping you grow and you helping me grow. That's a form of disrespect. Time is a gift. And discipline with our time management is the highest form of stewardship. And when I say discipline, if I was a note taker, I would write this down. Discipline is to lean into discomfort and visit there daily. Discipline is to lean into discomfort. Show me somebody who is disciplined and you just show me somebody who is familiar with discomfort. I'm on this like new running tip. I'm trying to start running three to four miles a day. And I wrote right above my mirror on the treadmill, discipline is to lean into discomfort. So as soon as my calves start burning, as soon as I start breathing heavy, I said, oh, there it is. That's what discipline feels like. There it is. That's what next level feels like. There it is. That's what new health feels like. Lean into that. Lean into that because that's discipline. But watch this. Regret is to lean into comfort and live there daily. Did y'all catch the difference? Discipline is to lean into discomfort and visit there daily. That's consistency. But regret is to lean into comfort and live there consistency, consistently. You don't want to change? Be comfortable. You don't want results? Live comfortable. You don't want your marriage to improve? Be comfortable. Don't deny your flesh. Don't crucify your sinful desires. Don't fast. Don't get up early and pray. Don't worship when you don't feel like worshiping. Because really there are only two times to worship when you feel like it and when you don't. <laughs> if you want to hand your life a list of regrets, be comfortable. Live comfortable. Discipline, discipline. The reason the Holy Spirit has us doing this series, I really believe, is twofold. Number one, God wants us to end the year with this series so that we can be better stewards over our time. The reason regret and anxiety is so high as we're about to end this year is because December 31st and New Year's Eve parties are a sobering reminder to many of us, you just wasted another year. 
Ooh, woo. <laughs> and so you got to start off saying 2024, it's going to be my year. You said that 2023, 2022, 2021. God's like, I've been ready for this to be your year since 2015. It's just you have to be obedient now. You have to start seeking my face now. You can keep prophesying over yourself all you want to, but just because the calendar on the year changes doesn't mean you will change if you're not intentional. He wants us to be better stewards over our time. And then number two, God's like, I need my people to grow up. I need you to spiritually mature. There should be a maturing with my children. See, you could be an old, bald-headed fool. <laughs> Wrinkles on your face, fool. Maturity has nothing to do with an increase of birthdays. Maturity and maturing is your ability to outgrow what used to fit. So maturing is when... If you would have said that to me in April, I would have cussed you clean out. <laughs> but now in November, I've learned how to hold my peace. If you would have came to me like that in July, you would have caught a real quick to peace. <laughs> but I've learned how to hold my peace. If you would have given me that offer, I was kind of thirsty back in August. But now I've learned I'm going to trust God's timing on things. And if this isn't the timing of God, if it ain't kingdom, I don't want it anyway. That's maturity. I'm maturing. There are certain outfits my son Josiah could wear that he can no longer wear now that he's seven months. It's because he's growing and maturing. Why can you still fit in the same outfit of petty? I mean, it's not kind of tight now. You don't have to like jump to put it on insecurity now. It fits the same. God wants his children to grow up. Therefore, some people grow up while others just get older. <laughs> and there's a difference. Some people grow up while others just get older. God wants us to mature. I want to speak around this thought from this subject. It's going to be kind of meaty at parts, but if I always give you milk, eventually over time, I'm going, I'm going to be contributing to your malnourishment. So I can't just give you milk. Today, we're going to have to chew a little bit. Okay. I want to speak around this thought from this subject, time tables, time tables, time tables. What if one of the methodologies of the enemy is to get you to waste time at a table, meaning get you to feed on things that's stealing your time. High five two people and tell them time tables. Time tables. Yes. Time tables. Tuesday night, I had a dream. I was outside the church in this parking lot, our first parking lot, and I was speaking to people, kind of similar to how it was last Sunday when we had the baked potato truck and I was just greeting certain people and just talking. We were outside the church and I saw this plane. It was flying kind of low and I remember pointing out to people, hey, y'all see this plane? And nobody looked. And I was confused on why nobody was looking at this plane. And as I looked back, I said, that plane is about to crash. It hits the ground in this neighborhood right next to the church, but it doesn't explode. The plane is on fire. Houses are on fire right next to the church. Houses are on fire. And so now I'm looking at people like, hey, we got to go help and see if anybody's over there. And nobody moved. Everybody in the parking lot was just looking shocked and stunned. And I'm sitting like, hey, come on, we got to go help. The fire department was sitting there with water, but not putting the fires out. And so in the dream, I know this had to be a dream because I would never do this. I jumped over the creek. <laughs> I jumped over the creek. I saw a house that was on fire. The door was shattered. I jumped through the fire. Got in the house, and everybody in the house is moving extra slow. And I'm hearing this cracking and, like, stuff is falling. The house is about to give way at any moment. I'm seeing these 
tables, and I'm seeing people move slow. And I said, y'all got to get out. The house is about to collapse. Y'all got to get out. And they're just walking really slow. And I begin to grab the people, snatch them out the house, and I wake up. And I'm like, Lord, what was that? I mean, my heart was beating all fast. I said, I would never jump in a burning house, <laughs> especially for people I don't know. And I begin to understand, because I've had some time to walk with God, to learn when a dream never leaves, when a dream stick with, sticks with you, God is trying to tell you something. So I'm, I'm praying and asking God, what does that mean? What does that mean? I share with my father because my father has the gift of interpreting dreams. And I'm praying and praying, and God began to share with me the answer. The, the plane is symbolic of the spiritual realm. It's the realm above the natural realm. It hitting the ground is God is going to allow things to shake up our world, shake up our homes, shake up our neighborhoods, and shake up our communities, shake up our school system. And everybody's going to be shocked at the things that God is going to allow, but he's about to start allowing a destabilization to everything you thought was stable. He's going to allow for it to be shaken, churches shaken, marriage shaken. But the part that was most confusing to me was why were people just standing there? And so I began to ask my dad, I said, what do you think that meant? Why were they just standing there? He said, that's the easiest part of the whole dream. God is trying to tell you, stop waiting for people. What God is telling for you to do, stop looking for people to support. Stop looking for people to understand. Stop looking for people to endorse. Whatever God is telling you to do, you just obey. They don't like it, you still obey. It's the holidays, you still obey. They unfollow you, you still obey. They follow, you still obey. They unsubscribe, you still obey. They do subscribe, you still obey. They start giving to the ministry, still obey. They stop giving to the ministry, you still obey. Because God is like telling you that there are people who are depending on your swift obedience. And the longer you wait, the more they risk collapsing in the state that they are in. I'm trying to speak to somebody. The book, write it. The podcast, start it. The channel, start it. The apology, give it. You think you have more time, but you don't know how much time you have. And then my own sermon came back and preached to me. I said, oh, that, that's it. Knowing what you're supposed to do in time will reveal confused lovers. What is that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Confused lovers are people who really think they love you. But they don't love you. They love what you do for them. They're confused. They love your time. They love your presence. They love your conversation. They love your generosity. They love your gift, but they don't love your person. And this is always revealed when you begin to make a decision that's in the best interest of your spiritual growth. Here it is. When you begin to make choices that's causing for you to follow Jesus, when you begin to make choices from obedience, like I'm obedient, you're going to end the adultery. You're going to end going to happy hour with them. You're going to end going to the hooker lounge with them. Y'all should see y'all faces right now. But I'm going to keep on preaching, keep my foot all on the gas. You're going to end gossiping with them. You're going to end backbiting. You're going to end hating on others. You're going to end being bitter. God is trying to tell you to obey. And when you start obeying, the way they respond to it. This is so good, y'all. The way they respond to it will reveal organic love from confused love. Because people who genuinely, lo genuinely love you, they love to see you win. They love to see you get closer in Jesus. They love to see you grow. They love to see you evolve. People who are confused lovers, they're threatened by it. Because the closer you get to Jesus, the more you remove what y'all had in common. Woo! Okay, I get it, I get it. Confused lovers, please hear me. The danger of confused lovers and our need for their acceptance is that's the fastest way for you to get in a cycle. Talk Holy Spirit. 
That's the fastest way for you to get in a cycle. And hell uses cycles to get us to waste time. This is why when they leave, be okay, because their exit was prophetic. Somebody needs to say that. Say their exit was prophetic. Is God giving you a prophetic protection? I'm protecting you from what has been prophesied over you, and they were going to cause you to live at six for 40 years and miss the appointed time that I have for you. So I love you so much, I let them leave. I love you so much, I evicted them out. That wasn't a breakup, that was me pushing them out. I'm trying to help you protect your time. Can we go a little deeper? We got to understand this family. The devil cannot create. All he can do is imitate. The devil cannot create. All he can really do is present and persuade. He presents a lie and persuades for you to believe it. He presents temptation and persuades for you to go there. That's all he can do. He cannot build. He cannot create because he is created. The only person that can create is Yahweh. So, since he knows, okay, I can't construct their tomorrow. Mm. But I can construct a cycle that will impact their tomorrow. So, if I can get them trapped in cycles, they will be in a cycle of self-sabotage. And they'll end up wasting their own time. And so, they'll never be a threat to me while they're in time. He seeks, he seeks, see, the reason I'm preaching so passionately is because revelation was never designed to be given to you on your deathbed. Did you hear me? If you get the revelation of time on your deathbed, that wisdom won't serve you because you don't have any more time to apply that wisdom. Revelations were never designed to be given on your deathbed. If they are given on your deathbed, the only person that they will serve is the people around you on your deathbed. Which is how Solomon got to this place at the end of his life where he was like, I did it all. I didn't had it all. And this is what I learned. Everything is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. This is what I learned. Honor God. Honor God, because revelation was never designed to be given at your deathbed. See, right now, this is an appointed time for all of us. God knew on November the 26th of 2003, they're going to get the revelation of time so now that they could steward it well. So that when they stand before me, they can't tell me I thought I had more time because they were given an appointed time where they could be told about time. So now they can maximize their time so I can hold them accountable for their time. Is this making sense? This is so good, y'all. The reason I'm preaching so passionately is because it's critical for you to break the cycle. You breaking the cycle, your testimony is going to be for you and people behind you. Your testimony is going to be their textbook. Talk. Your testimony is going to be their syllabus. Your testimony is going to be their blueprint. Your testimony could be your revenue. Okay. Okay. Our God is so awesome where he will create conditions where people will end up paying you to tell them how you got through. (laughs) He's going to allow you to do things where you would do it for free, but they're going to pay you for it. Do you have Bible to support that? Yes, I do. Exodus chapter 2. When Moses' mother was hiding Moses and he could no lo- she could no longer hide him, I want y'all to see what happened. Exodus chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbanks. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies. She said, then his sister 
asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Now read the Bible. The girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. I will pay you. So she took the baby and nursed him. I would have nursed my baby for free if Pharaoh wasn't trying to kill all two-year-old babies. But God has a way of orchestrating events where the very thing that the enemy is trying to do for evil, God's going to pay you back with peace. He's going to pay you back with joy. So you, you don't wait for people to help you. You do what God has called for you to do. What about the part me snatching people out the fiery house? There are people who think that they have time. And your obedience is literally going to cause for souls to never experience hell's fire. Literally, us being ambassadors of the kingdom, us being intentional with following Jesus, is going to help people never experience the flames of judgment. It's going to help people. I know we don't like to preach about hell and we don't like to preach about judgment. But regardless if you believe in it or not, it is real. And it never was designed for us. It was designed for, for Satan and his demons. But because we don't accept the gift of salvation, because we listen to the lies of the enemy, this is how we get separated. And God's like, listen, teach my people to obey because you are truly living in the end times. And your obedience is going to help people not experience physical death in time to where when they're no longer in time, they're apart from me forever. I want you to help seek and save the lost so that when their time runs out, they can spend the rest of eternity with me. And I do be believe the dream it's prophetic. It's not just for me. What is God telling for you to do that you don't know is tied to somebody getting out of something on fire? What is God telling for you to do that you keep telling him, I'll do later? See, most of us, if we be honest, when God gives us an instruction, this is what we really say. Let me go overthink and I'll get back to you on it. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Right. Let me go overthink about it, and I'll get back to you on it. Not knowing there are people who are depending on your obedience. Exodus chapter 9, verse 5, we started this scripture last week. It states, and the Lord appointed a set time, saying, tomorrow... The Lord shall do this thing in the land. And we learned that the root word in appointed is point. So there is a point that God has set in your lifetime for you to collide with. There are several points. There are points you're supposed to meet in 2023, 2024, 2025. You can have four points in 2024. See, because oftentimes the church teaches us that purpose is just this main thing versus understanding that you can fulfill purpose in each season of your life. Your purpose right now is to educate yourself of the Bible because you're talking about stuff you truly don't believe. And God wants you to really have an encounter with him so that when you go through a trial, you won't question him. You won't count as strange. You understand this is just a part of following Jesus. That might be your point. We all have a appointed time. So your point could be 9 o'clock. And there's nothing that you could do to rush this point. Somebody say a point. a point. Now this next text, I read this passage so many times, and I never saw this before. This just proves the Bible is truly inexhaustible. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. It says, when he, speaking of Jesus arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men 
coming from the tombs because demons like to keep you around dead things. Demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And then the Holy Spirit started to breathe on my study. Demons are even aware of timing. (laughs) Demons and devils are so aware of timing that they could tell when something is too early. I'm in the text. What does the text say? Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? So they're saying there's a point that has been set for us to experience judgment, and this right now is not the point. Have you come here to do something before the appointed time? Can we talk? One of the main methods of the enemy is to get us to pursue things before it's time. It's his main strategy. Give them the platform before they have maturity. Have them wake up love before they know self-control. I know the songs of Solomon say, do not wake love before it's appointed time. I'm going to try to get them to do it early. Bible all day. Luke chapter 4, verse 5. I don't preach opinions. I preach doctrine, okay? Luke chapter 4, verse 5. Look at this. Then the devil took him up. This is Jesus. I really got to do a sermon on satanic promotion. I have to do it. The devil took him up. Not Jesus. The devil took Jesus up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. So Satan is offering Jesus glory before the cross. Take it now. Take it. Don't wait for your appointed time. Take what's yours now. But Jesus says, I don't get crowned before I get crossed. I understand how it works. You have to first cross me before you crown me. Because once I'm crucified, once I die, and once I'm buried, I'm going to rise up on the third day with all authority in my hand. I'm going to crush the head of the serpent. What is head? Your authority. All of these earthly things, they're mine. And I'm going to have the keys of hell and of death. And I will be able to tell death, oh, where is your sting? The glory comes after the cross. I'm trying to help us, but the devil will try to give you the crown before the cross. Because one of the methods of hell is to give it to you before your appointed time. Somebody say time. Time. Now we're going to switch to tables. We're going to go a little deeper. Exodus chapter 40, verse 1. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, Notice the time he tells him to do it. On the first day of the first month. Give me it first. Give me worship first. Place the Ark of the Covenant law in it and shield the Ark with the curtain or the veil. Bring in the table and set out what belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. So that we can understand this, it's a little deeper, but it's not that deep if we could break it down. The children of Israel are out of Egypt. They're no longer slaves. They have yet to come into the promised land. So God is teaching them, I need for there to be a place of worship. The Ark of the Covenant, I created this chart just so you can see this. The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. Okay. The Ark of the Covenant is presence of God. Why was David dancing so, so much when he danced out of his clothes? He was thankful for the presence. Okay? The curtain represents separation. Veil in Hebrew is separate. So this separates the outer court from the most holy place. So when Jesus was crucified 
the Bible says the veil of the temple was torn. That means we now have access to the most holy one due to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Okay? The table represents what edifies us, what feeds us. The lampstand is symbolic of Christ. Jesus is the light of the world. Makes sense. So he says, okay, as y'all are no longer slaves, I have to create a place where my presence will be. And I need for them to glean from my table. Somebody say table. table. Okay, so they're leaving. He's introducing this new aspect. Now, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, it says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Watch the text. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and they were healed. So Jesus goes in the temple, flips the table, then, y'all missed it. Jesus steps in the church, sees what's going on in the church, flips the table. After he flips the table, then the blind and the lame can be healed. I believe Jesus has not been allowed in a lot of our churches in America. Because a lot of our churches have a lot of tables that's feeding you church brands, that's, that's feeding you self-help, that's feeding you legalism, that's feeding you entertainment, but not feeding you doctrine. And if Jesus were to be able to step in a lot of our churches, he would flip over the tables, then people get healed, then the blind can see, then the lame can walk. But it started with a table. Somebody say table. So we have time tables. Time tables. Last text, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. <laughs> you cannot have a part in both the Lord's table Your neck. <laughs> you can't have a part at the Lord's table and then the table of demons. It's so simple, y'all. I can't sit here and sit there at the same time. I can't, it's not that deep. I cannot sit here and sit there at the same time. I could only sit in one place. Which is why Jesus says, I'd rather you hot or I'd rather you cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you out my mouth. What does that mean? It disgusts me to think that you can have me and the world. <laughs> I'm so good that once you sit at my table, you should not want to go to that spoiled milk anymore, that leftovers, those crumbs. My meal should be so good. kind of like Thanksgiving. What my mama and Tanisha cooked and we all had together was so good. You need to come to our house? No, I'm full from this table. So, so watch this. This blew my mind in sermon prep. Let's merge the passages. Okay. So Exodus 9 verse 5, there is an appointed time. Okay. Matthew chapter 8 lets us know that even demons are aware of timing. Then, Exodus chapter 40, verse 1, as my children were exiting slavery, I had to introduce them to Yahweh because they were familiar with Pharaoh. Yeah. And I don't want them to continue to glean from Pharaoh. I want them now to hunger and thirst after righteousness from my table. Right. Then, Matthew 21, Jesus comes into the temple and flips tables. And then Paul says, okay, you can't sit at the Lord's table and the table of demons at the same time. So I got it. 
The enemy wants us to sit at the wrong tables, feed from those tables so that we could waste time. I get it. I get it. Y'all, this, this was like an aha moment to me as I was studying. Okay, maybe this is one of the reasons why your social media page is called your feed. <laughs> You're scrolling stuff that's feeding you. And so Satan is like, if I can get you to feed on comparison, if I can get you to feed on doubt, if I can get you to feed on insecurity, if I can get you to feed on loneliness, then you won't desire to sit at the Lord's table because you're so full uh, for my table. <laughs> this means I don't have to take y'all out of church. Come to church. Just eat my table first. So that when you're he hearing the living bread, you're burping from the, de the devil's table that you don't even have room for the Lord's table. <laughs> so this is why, please hear me, we have to stop trying to fast forward the wilderness season. Stop trying to skip it. Because the wilderness season is the season of detox. You can come out of Egypt, but still crave it. If you say I don't, you are a liar. Unless you've been walking for a while with the Lord. But when you first come out of it, your taste buds haven't shifted. Your eternal salvation is with Jesus. You saved. But your cravings are still the same. This is how, brothers, you could be here lifting your hands in worship. She walked by. Lord, have mercy. You're in the right place. Doing the right thing. But your taste buds haven't changed. Because if you were attracted before seeing fruit, There are a lot of fine, ugly people. It's okay if I touch you. There are a lot of fine, ugly people. You need to be so in tune with the spirit where you see fine, but you look for fruit. I'm not preaching one side. They don't care how they look. The devil is alive. But you should go off of fruit. And so I get it. The enemy is like, okay, if I can't get them to go back where they are, but they still have the same taste buds of where they've been. I could always offer them and tempt them with former entrees. Because yes, they're out of Egypt, but they still like the entrees of Egypt, which is why the Israelites kept saying, we remember in Egypt. We had meats and we had leeks and onions. They were talking about the feeding. Is this making sense? They were talking about the feeding of Egypt. So now as I'm looking at this text, I'm like, okay, I get it. I get it. It's about time and tables. The devil sends pawns from his table to get us to entertain them to waste time. Time and tables. But the Lord will send partners from his table to help you maximize your time so when you're out of time, you will be with him for eternity. Right, right, right. Timetables, I get it. The enemy will send critics from his table that will make you be hesitant of giving birth to what God put on the inside of you because you've been feeding on doubt so much, you've been feeding on comment sections so much, you've been feeding on what other people think so much that now you procrastinate. Not recognizing the longer you procrastinate, the more somebody's in the house that's on fire that could collapse. And your obedience is tied to you getting them out. Yeah. Timetables. Timetables, I get it. But the Lord will send you shepherds from his table to feed you. Look, I want you all to see this Bible all day. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will Feed you with knowledge and understanding. Stop believing that stuff. I don't need a pastor. I don't need to go to church. The Bible just said it. God has appointed shepherds, leaders to feed you with knowledge and understanding. For you to say, I don't need anybody, 
is a meal from the enemy's table. I'm trying to help us, y'all. Have you come here to torture us before our time? Demons are aware of timing too. I want to help us. The people that I had warned, just come. I want y'all to all come with the clock. I want y'all, and y'all just, just spread out. I want to help us. Y'all clap it up for my volunteers. Okay. I want y'all to see this. Just because somebody else got there before you does not mean you failed. Man, I'm trying to. I want this to be visual aid. Everybody is walking around with the clock. And everybody's point is different. Okay, so just because Dre got there at what? 829, almost 830, does not mean that Warren is better because he got there at 6. And so Dre can't feel like God is blessing Warren, but he's not blessing me. Yours is until 8. Make it sense. This is, this is one of the dangers of social media. It overexposes us to everybody's perceived point. Perceived, you caught that, right? Perceived point. I'm living my best life. I'm, you a lie. So look, I want us to get this. There is somebody right now, under the sound of my voice, or watching this message, who feels as though... God is taking too long with you because you're looking at Warren's time. When yours could be eight. It could be eight. Now, can we go a little deeper? Warren, you ain't going to like this, but let's go a little deeper. The reason Warren might get there early is because he's going to die sooner than Dre. Wow. (laughs) Because, listen, it's appointed unto every man to once die, okay? So he could die at 76, and he could die at 84. So what you think is him getting there early is God knowing his time is going to run out before yours, so you have a little more time for you to get there. Is this making sense? And this is why Warren can't feel as though okay, I got more time because Chelsea does. Her time is at 10 o'clock. So I can live how I want to live at 6 o'clock. But he doesn't know his time is 6. And he's not going to get to 10. Is this making sense? Everybody has a different time. Everybody. So, so Dre, his time is 8.30. Warren is 6 o'clock. Yours is like 6.01. Chelsea's is at 10 o'clock. They all have different times. And you can't see somebody's spiritual time. This is why comparison is so stupid. Can we go a little deeper? You cannot do anything to change your time. Now, what you can do, y'all reverse it. Reverse your times on your clock. What you can do is die before your time. But you can't do anything to make you reach your time earlier. What they're doing is choices. Y'all keep spinning it. Each choice is affecting time. Each decision is affecting time. Each relationship is affecting time. Now, what you want is a kingdom connection that helps you maximize time so that you can collide with your appointed time versus a demonic distraction that makes you waste time or lose time so that you miss your time. Is this making sense? Okay, thank y'all so much. Is this making sense? Every person you see has a different point. They have a different time. So now what I believe God is asking us is, do you really trust me? 
Because faith in me requires faith in my timing. Now, now look, look, there is a underpreached part about Jesus and our God that I want to bring to your attention and your awareness for a few moments. Then I have points and we're done. Y'all can go home and eat some turkey and yams again. <laughs> but, but there's a part of, part of God that I believe we often forget. And that is you and I serve a God who flips tables. See, we, we have to talk about this because this sugar-coated, watered-down preaching in America is not bringing revival. It's not bringing revival to our homes, not bringing revivals to our schools. It's not beckoning for God to pour out his anointing on our gatherings and our services. It's causing for people to be entertained to death. When we really understand what Jesus did on the cross, embracing the full wrath of God, every sin, past, present, and future, Jesus hanging there, bloody, mutilated, and disfigured, heart palpitating with love, thinking about me and thinking about you, because God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit did not want us to be a sin-stricken people walking the face of the earth without ever experiencing the the most holistic, soul-quenching, soul-satisfying relationship known to man. And that's not knowing God as creator to create in, but it's to know him as Abba, Father. It's to know him as Abba. Once we really understand that, the cross changes everything. The cross changes everything. Our God is a God who flips tables. And you probably never heard anybody say this, but can we give God praise for everything he flipped? Yeah. The relationships that he flipped, the strongholds that he flipped, the lies that he flipped, the dysfunction that he flipped. I know you can give God a praise for making a way, but can you give God a praise for flipping stuff out of the way. He flips tables. He flipped that relationship. He flipped that job. He flips the strongholds. He flips the addiction. He flips the porn. He flips the anxiety. He flips the jealousy. He flips, he's the one that flips tables. It's part of God that we don't preach enough. When you say, Jesus, save me, <laughs> what you really said is, Lord, whatever in my life needs to flip, whatever in my life you need to shake up, whatever in my life you need to overturn, flip it. Can we go a little deeper? Let's go a little deeper. Okay. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's three. Kill, steal, destroy. That's three. So if he can get you at one wrong table, three times one is three. Timetables. Maybe that could take three months off their life. Maybe that will cause for me to steal three years. Timetables. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. If he can get you at two wrong tables, Three times two is six. Maybe that could take six months off the time. Or maybe that could take six years off the time. Time tables. If I can get them to glean from three wrong tables, three times three is nine. So maybe I could steal nine months from their life or nine years from the life. I get it, church. He wants you to feed from the wrong place so that you can miss the right time. I got it. I got it. While we were sitting around on Thanksgiving tables, I'm sitting at the table having a revelation. I'm sitting there eating mac and cheese like, oh, man. He wants us at the wrong table. Not only does God prepare tables, he flips them too. And we've been preaching more about the prepared table and not the flip table. Because truthfully, if we be honest, ooh, this is going to sting. We really don't want God to flip our plans. We really don't. You want a God on your terms. 
See how quiet it's getting? Because in your mind, you have time. <laughs> I told y'all, you're going to have to chew a little bit today, okay? Have to chew a little bit. So I want us to say this confession, a few points, and we're done. Can I get us to say, Father, Father overturn, every table overturn every table that would cost for me, cost for me to miss my appointment. To miss my appointment. I, trust I trust your interruptions. Woo, let's say that again. Yeah. Father, Father, overturn every table, overturn every table. that would cost for me to miss my appointment, I trust your interruptions. See, while you say that, the Holy Spirit's like, bet. <laughs> you trust my interruptions, bet. <laughs> you trust my time and bet. We ain't gonna wait to 2024, then we gonna start today. I'm gonna start flipping some stuff today. <laughs> so, the robber of discernment then is speed. You ever notice dogs eat real fast? <laughs> you ever notice that? I've never seen a dog take his time. If y'all have, then y'all probably have a different breed. But I've seen dogs eat like it's their last meal. You get too close. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy wants you to have a nature of a beast. Eat fast. Move fast. Because rushing makes you go at life-wrecking speed. Not only do you need to recover, but everybody you hit needs to recover too. The danger of speeding under the influence is you're not sober-minded. And you heighten the possibility of hitting things that you would normally miss if you were sober-minded. But if you wouldn't have drank from that table, you would have sobriety while you're navigating down highways. He's after your time. He wants us to rush. God wants you to maximize your time. So when you're out of time, you could be with him for all of eternity. Many of us, I'm telling you, your prayers sound like this. God, fast forward. Fast forward this. Hurry up. I'm running out of time. I'm 36. Hurry up. I'm 40. Where is he at? I'm 50. Where is he at? You ain't going to have it. <laughs> we never take into consideration our role, though. We always, timing of God, never our obedience and maximizing. Okay? So, I want you to see this, this time lapse. This time lapse. Because the enemy wants you to go at Wrecking speed, fast speed, real quick, super fast. I don't want you to think, don't pray about it, just do it. Don't acknowledge me, just do it. Now stop it. What were some of the images that y'all saw? Trees, streets. Okay, now play it again, slow down. Play it again, slow down. And so what you'll see is you'll miss the warning signs of God when you're going too fast. So when God's saying, stop, this, this isn't me, you miss that. You're going so fast. You would have saw it if you slowed down, but it was going so fast. You miss God saying, this isn't my will. Cities, this is your placement. You miss the places God wants you to be when you're moving so fast. Slow down, you can look and see, okay, that's a city. Somebody said trees. You only saw trees when it was really a city. <laughs> because when you're moving too fast, you miss the big picture. You miss what God is trying to teach you. You miss the season. You don't even know what season you're in because you're rushing so fast. Wow. So you can't perceive the times and the seasons because you're going at life-wrecking speed. But remember, to have faith in God is to also have faith in his timing. Right. What if one of the reasons God is going at this pace is so that you don't miss any place? You don't miss any sign. 
You don't miss any season, but you could be aware of the seasons that you're in. Don't just say you have faith in me. Have faith in my timing. Have faith in my timing. Because timing affects everything. Everybody who is cooking this week could tell you timing affects everything. That dry turkey had too much time. <laughs> that moist flavor one had the perfect amount of time. That cake that was real dry spent too much time in the oven. The one that was nice and moist spent the perfect time because timing affects impact. You could be swole and know how to swing a bat, but if you don't know the timing, you will always strike out, not because you don't have the skill, but you don't have the timing. If you're fighting somebody who is stronger than you, but you start to pace and learn their timing, you could see every time they throw the right, they leave their face wide open. And so you could win a fight because you timed it right. Timing. <laughs> All of us are here right now because your mom and daddy got together at the right Timing. There was a time where the sperm wouldn't have hit the egg, but the timing was just right for your, your mother to conceive and have you in the earth. There are people who are trying, but they can't get the timing right. All of us are here because timing was right. Timing. Timing. So let's give you these five points and you can go home. How do we not feed at the wrong table? Number one, removal. Okay. Removal. Trust when Jesus flips a table. Okay? I know that you're trying to not go back to the hookah bar, but you still want to. He removed it. Watch this, though. He never removes a thing without becoming it. He who knew no sin became sin for us. So he's saying, okay, the high that you've been trying to get, allow me to become the most high. Sleeping with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, that pleasure that you've been trying to get at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let me become it, but I have to first remove it. Remove it. You're going to have withdrawals. That's normal. I wish I would have heard a preacher tell me that. Seriously, because I'm thinking I'm not saved. I still want to go back. I still want to watch porn. It's like, no. Withdrawals, that's the heart's way of raging because your pattern has changed. It's a part of it. Let me remove the table. Number two, let me renew your appetite. He removes, and then he renews. Right. Hear me, family. You don't end up at the place you desire. You end up at the place you crave. Okay. You ever desire to lose weight, but you ended up at the refrigerator? <laughs> I'm being real. I have. <laughs> I'm going to run three miles a day. You at the refrigerator. My desire did not match what I wanted because my cravings haven't changed. I want the good I want to do that I don't do. But the evil I don't want to do. What a wretched man I am. What is Paul saying? I need God to renew me. Who could save me from this body of death? Only Jesus could do that. And I'm trying to get us to understand after he removes, he has to renew. After he renews, number three, he replaces it. Okay. Okay. Replacement. So you're saying, I'm just going to stop this. I was saying January 1st, 2024, I'm going to stop. But I'm going to stop today. God has to replace it with something. Okay. Okay. He did. So for me in my life, all right, I don't need to go to the Greek parties. What am I going to do on Friday night? Hmm. I'm going to have all the young men, the teenagers, Come up to the church. We're going to play basketball and have Bible studies. Remove it. Remove carnal with kingdom. 
Now, was the devil telling me, you're not worthy? You just was at the Greek party talking about, oh, you, were just, you were just doing all that. You, yeah, he was doing all that. Because that's meals from his table. But I recognize God cleans you as you go. Stop believing the lie. When I get, when I stop, when I, no, he cleans you as you go. There was a level of accountability that hit me. Can I be honest? Not just because I love Jesus, but I knew I had Bible study with the young men. I did. That's why some of us won't join ministries. Some of us won't serve. What I look like up here singing about Jesus? <laughs> no one, I'm going, you don't want the weight. You don't want the accountability of replacement. The fastest way. I'm not saying get a platform. I'm saying serve the body. Jesus chose some ratchet dudes. They weren't converted. They had entrepreneurialism down. He didn't choose nobody lazy. Think about it. They had businesses. Jesus was smart. He chose Peter. He had a boat. I need you to help me get around the world. Make sense? He didn't choose nobody lazy. He chose people maximizing their time. But they weren't converted yet. Last point, number four, remember. Remember, it's appointed unto every man wants to die. So what you remember will either be your aggravation or your ammunition. What do you remember? Remember the trauma, aggravation. Remember the promises, ammunition. The beauty of devotion, there have been literal times where I read something in the morning, got tested on the highway, and that scripture came right back up. It's like, man, that's wow. How did, that, how did God know? It's like he doesn't know all things. But your devotion fills you with ammunition to resist the temptation of the wrong tables. I believe that this is prophetic series. I really do. God is trying to get us to understand time is a gift. And your life is like a vapor. Here one minute, gone the next. And me, it terrifies me to think about standing before God and Him asking, what did you do with my time? It's not yours. What did you do with the time I gave you? did nothing. I tried to build my platform. I tried to chase things that were fleeting. I didn't serve faithfully. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm trying to remind you that you have a time. You have a time. And while you're here, have wisdom with it so that you can meet every single point that God has ordained for you to meet. So God in this moment we ask, please, don't allow this word to just be a flash fire. Light us on fire for a moment, then we leave here and go back to our sin affairs at the wrong tables. God flipped them. With our hands raised all over the building, lifting our hands right now, God, we say, we're taking our hands from plates that are keeping us in the same place year after year. Flip the table. Whatever table is keeping us stuck, flip it. Whatever addiction is keeping us stuck, flip it. And God, we thank you that you won't just flip it, but then you'll take us to your table and you'll feed us living bread and you'll feed us living water and you'll feed us the bread of heaven. Help us to hunger and thirst after righteousness because if we're honest, God, we don't right now. But we want to. We desire to. Change our appetite. So we don't end up at the place we desire. We end up at the place we crave. We're asking that you do it. In Jesus' name, and everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you say amen? Just bless you on today. I just believe it's a prophetic statement. Can I get everybody one more time to say, Jesus, Jesus 
flip every table table. that's wasting my time. time. I trust your interruptions. interruptions. Something's different on this series. I don't know. But I said that also in voices. (laughs) Um, But I, I really do want us to be stewards over our time. So as we're getting closer and closer to the end of this year, God can still change you. Time is not done yet. Whatever miracle, freedom that you're asking God to do, he still could do it now. But you must participate with your obedience and maximizing your time. So if there's anybody that has not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're all going to say this prayer collectively because you don't know how much time you have. So can I get all of us to say, Jesus, Jesus, I surrender. surrender. You promised me me in your word, word. if I confess with my mouth mouth and believe in my heart heart. that you were raised from the grave, grave. I shall be saved. I I believe that. that. Now save me, me. change me, me. and most most importantly, change my appetite. So that I hunger hunger and thirst thirst after righteousness. righteousness. I thank you for it. it. In Jesus' name, name. amen. 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 Amen.